Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second panel today. We have two speakers in this session. Um, and we'll begin with Naomi Davidson, who teaches French history at the University of Ottawa, where she's an associate professor. Her first book, called Only Muslim, Embodying Islam in 20th Century France, was published by Cornell University Press in 2012 and won honorable mention for the French Colonial Historical Society's Hegway Prize. It explores the French construction of Islam from the 1920s through the 1980s, tracing the creation of a distinctly French vision of Islam that would inform public policy and political attitudes towards Muslims throughout the century. She's currently working on a project about Muslim and Jewish religious sites and practices in France and Algeria in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Her talk today is entitled Je veux que l'Islam brille au cœur de la République, Making Islam Public in 20th Century France. Please help me in welcoming Naomi Davidson. Thank you, Gretchen, for that introduction, and, um, and thank you. I'll echo uh, Ian and Ethan in, in thanking Louis and everyone else who has brought us here, um, Chaude and Kit, who have helped with bringing us here, and I'm, I'm very grateful and honored to be part of this group, and it's, uh, it's also a lot of fun to be on a panel with my auntie, um, who we've known each other for years, uh, from Chicago to Paris and, and elsewhere, um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of think about uh, my book um, in light of some more recent events, in light of some of the, the, the things I've been thinking about since having written it, and that's what I'm going to try to do here today. So we have all seen evidence of the myriad ways that Islam, and more specifically the practice of Islam in metropolitan France, have been mobilized by French politicians across the ideological spectrum with ever increasing frequency. Talking about Islam as a shorthand for talking about immigration, socioeconomic and gender inequalities, globalization, or terrorism has only gained more traction in light of the upcoming elections this spring, the presidential elections. One of the initial candidates for the Socialist Party's nomination, um, former Prime Minister Manuel Valls, has, as Ethan pointed out to us earlier, I, Ethan, wherever he is, um, uh, has, um, paid a lot of attention to Muslim practices, um, particularly gendered ones, and most especially those that are publicly visible. And one of the items on his platform, um, when he was still a candidate, included inscribing laicite into the very text of the French Constitution. At the same time, in attempting to appeal to a broader spectrum of voters, Valls began to argue that his defense of laicite did not target Islam in particular. On the contrary, it was a vision that respected Islam and wanted Islam to assume the same place as all other religions in France. Yet it seemed that what he really wanted was not an Islam that was unremarkable, as, as unremarkable as Catholicism or Judaism, neither of which, as both Ian and uh, Ethan have reminded us, has ever been especially unremarkable in France, um, but an Islam that occupied a central place in the life of the Republic. He said, as he pointed out, je veux que l'Islam brille au cœur de la République. I want Islam to shine in the heart of the Republic. His successful rival in the recent leftist primary, Benoit Hamon, has argued that Valls' vision of laïcité, and I quote here, has become a useful pretext to attack Islam, unquote. And Benoit Hamon um, assesses the current situation in France by saying that in France, and here again I cite, Un bon musulman, c'est un musulman qui n'est pas musulman. So a good Muslim is a Muslim who is, a Muslim who is not Muslim. Um, or in some ways, to, to go back to Ian's Voltairean Muslim, right? A, a Muslim who doesn't actually really believe or practice Islam. So here today, I'm interested in looking back at how this 21st century electioneering that puts Islam at the heart of the Republic, in Valls' formulation, has in fact been integral to France's management of Islam in the metropole since the First World War. The French state, I argue, has always required that Islam, and Muslim practices in particular, be made public and visible in spite of the public-private distinction that is said to be so central to laïcité. <clears throat> 
I'd like to think about how different state actors celebrated certain kinds of Islam, going so far as to financially subsidize their public performance, while arguing that other forms of Muslim life were troublingly invisible or unknowable and not deserving of support. This process was, of course, a deeply paradoxical one, since maintaining that Islam's practices were so crucial to the Republic that they must be defended and subsidized would seem to be in direct contradiction with the concomitant argument made by French politicians that Islam was entirely compatible with the Republican secularism that governed the state's relationships with other religious groups. In exploring how laïcité has not precluded, but rather has required, the public performance of some Muslim practices, I suggest that we look elsewhere than the problems that are posed for the public abstract individual, to use Joan Scott's formulation, by religious particularism for explanation of French's so-called Muslim problem. I suggest that French state's actors insisting on Islam's potential laïcité, while at the same time making it impossible for Islam to be a private religion, to be a, a secular or laic religion, created the conditions for a long process of racializing Muslims that had to do with bodies rather than religious practices. The institution that has embodied this kind of Republican or um, French Islam, and it's interesting that Valls is again talking about an Islam de France, um, as, as was mentioned in the first setting, um, this is something that comes a lot earlier, um, is the Paris Mosque, which was built as a physical symbol of Islam's place in the heart of France and to render Muslim practices visible. Opened in 1926, across from the Jardin des Plantes and not far from the Panthéon, the vitrine d'Islam, the showcase of Islam, as its founders called it, was also designed to perform commensurability between Islam and the Republic. The argument that the mosque's supporters made in seeking parliamentary support for their project was a contradictory one. On the one hand, they said, they were asking the French state to fund a Muslim institute that would study all issues pertaining to colonialism in France's Muslim colonies. In other words, they were essentially asking the National Assembly to fund a think tank kind of institution rather than a religious one. Such an institution, they argued, would not compromise the state's commitment to secularism. This was especially important, politically speaking, after, because this, these debates were occurring years after the passage of the law of 1905, which, as we all know, uh, makes it illegal to finance new religious sites. On the other hand, in the very same breath in which Senator Edouard Herriot assured his colleagues that he sought funding for this purely secular um, Muslim institute, he also requested funding for a mosque. Herriot explained that because the French state guaranteed religious freedom to the residents of its empire, there was nothing to stop the metropolitan state from providing colonial subjects with a Muslim religious site in the metropole. This justification, of course, um, kind of implied that the French state funded religious institutions all over the colonies, which was not, in fact, the case. He further clinched his argument by reminding his fellow politicians that the state would not be subsidizing the mosque directly, but rather providing funds to a Muslim-led association that would directly oversee, at least in theory, the construction and administration of this site. Yet the political sleight of hand that he and his fellow um, founders used to present the complex as simultaneously secular and religious was not merely a rhetorical tool designed to convince skeptical colleagues to support its creation. In fact, this institution revealed the dual elements of the French Islam, this Republican Islam, whose practices were to be embodied in the site. The Muslim Institute proved Islam's compatibility with French values, especially and including secularism. Both the mosque's Muslim leader, um, the Algerian-born Sikadul Ben Gabrit, and his French colleagues and supporters emphasized that the greatest concern and the greatest value shared by both Islam and French republicanism was equality. And at the mosque's inauguration, the French president himself proclaimed that, quote, the Muslim savants exalt the respect of individual dignity and human liberty. They have called for the reign of a large fraternity of, and of equal justice. Democracy has no fundaments other than those." Unquote. 
Thus, one part of this French Islam equation resided in the designation of Islam as an intellectual or civilizational entity, one almost devoid of practices or traditions, or even, for that matter, of believers. Um, in this vision, Islam was completely compatible with French secular republicanism because its goals were the same, and it did not demand anything of its believers other than devotion to justice and equality. To make this compatibility with French values visible in the capital's cityscape, the founders uh, in, argued in favor of and defended the choice to build the Muslim Institute in the Latin Quarter, right, to signal its connection to French universities, museums, um, and the connections between, the long connections between Muslim intellectuals and French thinkers. The mosque, on the other hand, was charged with demonstrating that French Islam was still firmly located within orthodox Muslim practices, at least as filtered through French understandings of those practices. Most importantly, its architecture and aesthetics were to reflect Islam's unchanging nature, and specifically the requirement that embodied Muslim practices be observed in a particular setting. And I emphasize here that this is a French understanding of those, um, those requirements. To this end, it was modeled on a particular 14th century Moroccan mosque and designed by French architects who had served as members of the Moroccan Protectorate's Department of Fine Arts. The architects conceived the site as a space whose very architecture was devoted to rendering visible Arab culture, and Arab and Muslim are used interchangeably um, in these discussions, while drawing a discreet veil over Muslim practices. While the guest houses and restaurants that made up this mosque complex were described explicitly as spaces to, quote, serve all Muslims and the Parisian public, unquote, as were the gardens, the one space that was to remain somewhat private um, from non-Muslim eyes was the salle de prière, the, the prayer room. This room was destined only for, quote, worshipers, um, Muslim worshipers, and featured, quote, chandeliers and lamps made in Muslim lands whose light will be sufficiently discreet so as to preserve mystery and meditation, unquote. The mystery of Muslim prayer, then, was to be preserved from prying non-Muslim eyes, even as Muslim culture was to be displayed for a curious French public in the rest of this mosque institute complex. Yet this site, whose architects did, um, did pay a lot of attention to the division of public and private spaces, was used in its entirety as a space for the very public display of Islam and Muslim practices. The mosque's first leader, who was one of its initial um, uh, supporters, the Algerian-born Sikh Abdul Ben Gabrit, who I mentioned earlier, cooperated with metropolitan and colonial officials alike to organize many ceremonies that provided non-Muslim French observers with a performance of Islam, designed to convince them of its com potential compatibility with laïcité, and at the same time, broadcasting French support for this secular compatible or secular friendly Islam. During the interwar years, um, the mosque filled with representatives from government ministries and colonial officials, with police surveillance teams and representatives from the military at every significant moment in the Muslim religious calendar. During occasions like Eid al-Kabir, the expansive collection of pastries and tea that the mosque offered its faithful and guests was accorded far more importance than the holiday significance in the Muslim religious calendar. Furthermore, the fact that Muslims observing the holiday um, at the mosque were outnumbered by non-Muslim French observers throughout the interwar period suggests that the performance of these cultural um, or so-called folkloric aspects of Muslim religiosity were, was more central than the presence of Muslims themselves at the mosque. This tendency um, of the public display of Islam, the public celebration of Islam at the Paris mosque continued during the Second World War when holiday celebrations at the mosque continued in spite of the difficulties, the financial and other difficulties produced by the war, they were in fact considered a priority of, um, of the, the state, uh, even at this time of great, great difficulty. 
And this um, makes me think of some of what, what Ethan mentioned in his talk about the debates, the contemporary debates around um, the school lunches, right? And the question of not allowing the possibility in some municipalities to have a, a vegetarian option so that Muslim, um, not to mention Jewish families, can, can opt out of the pork. Um, uh, which is increasingly, I think, characterizing the contemporary moment. It's interesting to, to look back and think that in um, December of 1941, the Secours National, in cooperation with other government agencies, arranged to provide free halal uh, couscous dinners in North African restaurants across Paris. This was considered a, a vital priority. Um, they distributed ration cards for halal mutton to poor Muslim families. These efforts were often undertaken through the efforts of the mosque's leader, Sikadour, who reminded French officials that the French state had always managed to find ways to provide Muslims with, as he put it, quote, food products which are traditionally part of the ritual meals of our co-religionists, unquote. And I think it's interesting to think about this slippage between his references to both tradition and ritual to demonstrate how French support for the private practices of Islam this time, of course, they were performed publicly with some fanfare with these mass distributions of food, was contingent on those practices being identified as traditional rather than religious rites. Throughout um, the occupation and even in the years immediately following the liberation, um, Sikador continued to use the Paris region's Muslim authorities and other government agencies to publicize the dates and times of holiday services at the mosque and to continue this distribution of halal food. Um, the, the archives are full of discussions about how much one should pay for black market halal sheep um, and what, how that changes after the liberation. Um, there was a special commission for Muslim holidays that was created after the war in order to oversee the elementary aspects of the celebration of Muslim holidays in the Paris region to ensure that this could continue in the, in the post-war era. But what shifts in the post-war era, interestingly from the interwar years, um, is that concerns a departure from earlier modes of displaying Muslim practice concern the prayer services on Muslim holy days at the Paris mosque. After the war, religious services were to be attended exclusively by Muslims, while non-Muslims were invited only after the, quote, observance of a strictly religious nature had ended, unquote. The same word, ceremony, is used to describe both the Muslim prayers, which were to be private in the morning, and the subsequent public uh, receptions with French guests. So, but a clear distinction was made between the performing of religion, whose sacrality had to be respected, and the performing of Muslimness, which required a French audience. The public performance of Islam in the same space as where its private rituals had just taken place complete with um, the enjoyment of North African tea and pastries, allowed non-Muslim French observers the sensation of themselves having participated in some fashion in this public display of Islam. So again, we see the French state's desire to really put Islam at the heart of the Republic by rendering its private practices public. So this kind of complicated visibility, which underscored moments of carefully maintained and choreographed privacy, um, concerned only those Muslim religious sites whose financial support depended on the French state, such as the Paris Mosque and some of its satellite institutions. The Muslim practices of people who, by and large, remained uninterested in participating in, in the, this official kind of French Republican Islam um, at the mosque or at some of its um, satellites were troublingly hidden or invisible to the French police agents and representatives of colonial administrations whose job it was to report on them. For example, in the interwar years, the Moroccan protectorate sent envoys to the Paris region to investigate how Moroccan Muslim subjects organized their lives in the metropole. One of their principal activities was seeking out the sites where, Muslim, where Moroccans practiced Islam. <coughs> Although as the préfet of the Seine warned the foreign minister when describing the religious lives of Moroccan immigrants to the Paris region in the interwar years, quote, theirs is a very particular Islam with its sheen of paganism, its laws, its marabout, its everyday life material habits. In short, it's an Islam on the margins of the Quran." Unquote. And another one of these Moroccan envoys added, 
quote, all these Berbers who are in France, we can't tell them they're not Muslim. They are, and they say they are, but their religion is on the back burner, unquote. So what were these not quite Muslims, these pagan Muslims doing so far from the Hispano-Moresque arches of the Paris mosque? It wasn't entirely clear to French observers um, whose reports admit that they didn't personally attend any of these gatherings and were forced to rely on the accounts of informants who were telling them what was going on. They concluded that the Islam of these, um, these Moroccans and some other North Africans was said to revolve around visits from Moroccan marabou on tours throughout France or on collective prayers organized in individual homes or workers' hostels. Yet these French observers didn't quite know what to make of these gatherings, um, which were often structured around um, the auspices of mutual aid societies, where no prayers were said, but where men, quote, eat couscous together, drink mint tea, listen raptly to stories, hear musicians, singers, and dancers who dressed in traditional garb entertain them for long hours, end quote. These mutual aid society meetings sometimes involved um, visits from religious leaders, but seemed to have as much, if not more, to do with working class social solidarity, as the goal of these meetings was to raise money for compatriots in need, often for repatriation to the Maghreb. The fact that these meetings, like the prayer sessions in private homes, remained off limits to French observers who had to content themselves with informers' reports, I suggest, had much to do with the labeling of this form of Islam as pagan, primitive, or outside the bounds of religious orthodoxy. While some of the French observers who were so dismissive of these Moroccan men's practices did have some knowledge of Islam and disparage this folkloric Islam in very predictable ways, it was also the case that the private Muslim worlds that these working class men um, had managed to create for themselves frustrated French officials who expected and in fact required Islam to be publicly performed or at the very least to signal its private practices in a more public manner. So far I've explained how French officials sought to meld the secular and sacred, public and private, in um, in ceremonies and other activities at the Paris Mosque during the interwar years, while inventing a kind of aesthetic for French Islam sites and practices. Now I'd like to turn to the erasure of this kind of republicanism or secularism of French Islam that followed very quickly on the heels of uh, the mosque's creation. And here I'm interested in looking at how North African immigrants who are assumed to be um, primarily and exclusively indeed uh, Muslim came to be kind of set within Muslim bodies through the creation of a series of social service agencies and policies and practices that emerged during the interwar years. So kind of at, this, at the same time as this mosque was created. The national administration and countless Parisian social service agencies moved fairly quickly after the mosque's construction to launch a series of Muslim-oriented social service centers in the region, including a Franco-Muslim hospital designed by the very architects who had just completed the construction of the Paris mosque. These Parisian social service institutions designed to, um, to work with and for the, the North African Muslim population of the capital region foreclosed the very openness that the, uh, the Paris mosque wanted to suggest about the compatibility of Islam with French civilization. For if Islam could be French, could be compatible with secularism according to the logic of French Republican Islam, Muslims themselves could only be Muslims and as such would require this different administrative regime. The centerpiece of these interwar um, Muslim agencies that I'm going to turn to now was known to the capital's North African population as the Rue Le Comte um, for the street where it was located. It was formerly known as the North African Brigade. <clears throat> it was established almost entirely through the efforts of Pierre Gaudin, a member of Paris's municipal council, but more importantly, someone who had risen through the ranks in this, uh, the Algerian colonial administration. His goal in directing the center was to, quote, monitor and help, unquote, the city's North African population because their arrival in the Paris capital region 
um, represented what he called, quote, Islam's approach. So this is very much um, a, a set of institutions that is devised around Islam. A bare bones version of this site opened in 1925, a year before the mosque itself was inaugurated. Initially, it was comprised of a labor placement office where North African workers were required to register and obtain identity papers. Within the next few years, the Rue Le Comte grew to include a cafe, which was largely ignored by the city's North African population, a clinic which specialized in tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases, and an 80-bed workers hostel. Gaudin's agency also oversaw the establishment of several satellite centers in the Parisian suburbs, which functioned similarly to the original Rue Le Comte, but which also included um, prayer rooms as well as hammams which they considered to be integral to the experience of Muslims who would be using these centers. By marking social services as Muslim and then requiring the city's Muslims to make use of them in terms of um, registering and other legal requirements, the city, in cooperation with the national government, made clear that nominally Muslim subjects could not be simply workers, young men, Moroccans, Algerians, or anything else. They were first and foremost Muslims. And the site that did the most to kind of um, instantiate or cement this policy of representing um, these, these immigrant working class men as Muslims more than anything else was the Franco-Muslim Hospital of Bobigny, um, the Paris suburb, um, which was inaugurated in 1935. The hospital was another of Gaudin's projects, and it was supposed to address the medical community's concerns about, quote, African pathology which demands doctors and nurses with, with specialized education, unquote. But also, as he put it, North Africans in Paris's public hospitals, quote, found none of the traditions and customs which are so important to them and to which they are so faithful, unquote. So this was supposed to make them feel um, as if they had found a place that supported their traditions and customs. As in the Paris Mosque, the architecture and aesthetics of the site served as the physical space where the embodied practices of Islam could be properly performed. <coughs> Daily life at the hospital was to revolve around Muslim religious practice. Rooms were set aside for the slaughter of animals for patients' meals. There were prayer and ablutions rooms, and both staff and patients were supposed to follow the rhythm of the Muslim religious calendar. Most patients arrived at the hospital's doors in police vans, having attempted to obtain treatment at Parisian public hospitals, and then having been invited by the Parisian police to go to Bobigny instead. Once inside the hospital's doors, a full third of patients still refused to be treated and preferred to simply leave. So we can see um, through the records of the use of this hospital that Muslims did not seem to be particularly interested in being treated at this hospital that was supposed to be designed for their comfort and their, um, their access to tradition. Regardless of the North African community's response to this medical regime that French officials had put in place for them, the hospital's design was predicated on the belief that Muslim bodies were beholden to particular embodied rituals that required a particular kind of aesthetic space, very similar to that of the Paris Mosque. It continued this policy of making Muslim practices visible and public um, and blurring the lines between Muslim private lives and the very public life in this hospital. Um, I'm now going to jump, in the interest of time, to the 1970s, which is a moment that in some ways um, kind of parallels this, this moment of the 1930s that I've been talking about um, for most of this talk. As in the 1930s, the French state was faced with the question of how to manage an influx of immigration from Muslim-majority countries. In the latter period, however, changed immigration policies on both sides of the Mediterranean meant that not only North Africans, but now additionally um, larger numbers of West Africans and their families were beginning to settle permanently in France. As we know, um, for throughout the 1930s, 40s, uh, there was the assumption that this was a temporary labor migration that would, and people would, would return to the other side of the Mediterranean eventually. Um, so when we're talking about the 1970s, we're talking about a new understanding of a, a Muslim population in France that would be permanent rather than temporary. 
One of the government agencies created to cope with this new um, sedentary, uh, to use their word, immigration, was the Secretariat for Foreign Workers. The agency believed that the difficulties um, that these formerly colonial peoples faced upon their arrival in France stemmed from um, the, what they called the rupture of spiritual ties, which they argued played an essential role in the collective and individual equilibrium of people in so-called Islamic societies. At the heart of the state's cultural politics of immigration in the 1970s then was the identification of Islam as the defining aspect of North and West African immigrants' lives. As the Secretariat for Foreign Workers um, agency explained in a document from 1975, laying out the French state's obligations to its Muslim immigrants, and here I'm citing, what importance does Islam have in the lives of Muslims to push a secular state like France to take the Islamic religion into account and to decide to help in the construction of religious sites? Man, according to Islam, is a man who has submitted to God, who is present throughout his life. The personal and community status of a Muslim is eminently religious and informs every aspect of public and private life for the faithful." Unquote. So in this formulation, because Muslims were incapable of separating their public and private spheres, as secularism would require them to do, the French state had to provide them with the means to live their religious duties in everyday life. This translated into state support for projects ranging from aid to existing mosques, to the construction of prayer rooms, or to the transformation of other public spaces for use in Muslim rituals. The creation of these sites necessary for the completion of embodied rituals, however, completed a process by which Muslims uh, were stripped of any other identities and considered by the French state and by some Muslim leaders themselves almost exclusively as Muslim. So what I've been trying to sketch out with these few vignettes chosen from primarily the interwar years but um, the 1970s as well is that over the course of the, the 20th century, Islam became an embodied identity that robbed the people whom the state identified as Muslim of any other potential political, ethnic, national, um, cultural identities. Looking at embodied Muslim practices and Muslim everyday life in France during the 20th century suggests that perhaps we need to think about the ways in which Muslims were assigned to the category of, of Muslimness or of Islam because of their very selves, their very bodies, rather than because of the actual content of their different religious practices. Um, and here I'm thinking about the, the kind of secularism a framework that so often defines um, discussions about Islam in France and which, which is very helpfully structuring so many of our conversations today. And I think that tracing the genealogy of French Islam, as I've tried to do um, in a few chosen moments from the 20th century, shows how the supposed incompatibility between secularism and Islam is in fact carefully manufactured over the course of the 20th century. But I'm suggesting that we, we should also move beyond that to look at the ways in which a kind of invisible religious difference, um, Muslim religious difference, came to function in similar ways to visible racial difference in other circumstances. So that it might be productive to think about um, the category of Muslim as a category of embodied or racialized difference rather than a category of religious difference. The process of essentialization um, was made possible by the complicated ways in which Islam was rendered public as part of a commitment to proving Islam's supposed compatibility with secularism while simultaneously making that compatibility impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for that very interesting talk. I'd now like to introduce uh, Mayanti Fernando, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, where she's also affiliated with the Departments of Feminist Studies and History of Consciousness. She's the recipient of fellowships from, among others, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, Fulbright, and the Social Science Re Research Council. Her first book, called The Republic Unsettled, Muslim French and the Contradictions of Secularism, was published by Duke University Press in 2014. 
It addresses the intersection of religion and politics in contemporary France. She's currently working on two projects. The first concerns the regulation of migrant intimacies in France and the sex gender norms of secularity. The second takes up recent academic turns to animism, indigenous ontologies, and animal-human relations, inquiring into the secular genealogies of this post-humanist moment. She will be speaking to us today about sex and secularism, the embodied politics of public-private. Mayanti, thank you. Thank you all for coming out on what turned out to be a really beautiful day. Um, thank you also to Lewis for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to be in such a focused conversation with, um, with so many of, of the people who have been in conversation sort of in my scholarship but haven't necessarily met in person. Um, I'm gonna pick up on uh, Naomi's paper to think a little bit more about the aesthetic and embodied practices that underpin the secular construction of public and private. Um, it seems like my thing is already on. I'm gonna turn it off for a second. So let me begin. Um, secularism in France and elsewhere is conventionally defined as the political and juridical separation of church and state and the retreat of religion to the, public, uh, to the private sphere. However, a number of scholars now understand secularism as a historically evolving normative project of government that entails the administrative intervention into and transformation of what are called retroactively religions or religious traditions. The secular state defines the spaces religion should inhabit, authorizes the sensibilities proper to it, and then works to discipline religious traditions and religious subjects into conformity with this abstract notion and those attendant sensibilities. Much of this recent scholarship, including my own, has focused on legal transformations and on the law's construction of public versus private, politics versus religion. That focus makes sense given the secular state's use of the law to mold, discipline, and differentiate its subjects. At the same time, I want to be careful not to reinscribe secularism's self-narrative that law is its primary mode of enactment and to attend to the law's imbrication in other institutional practices and social, aesthetic, and bodily norms that work together to produce, on the one hand, a discrete, privatized notion of religion, and on the other, the subjectivities and sensibilities of the secular. Naomi has nicely elucidated the normative spatiality of, uh, the, of proper, that is, secular religion, and I turn now to the secular critique of Islamic veiling as a way to understand the sexual and bodily norms of the properly secular woman. I'll be picking up on the themes of opening up and surveillance and neither nor visibility that Naomi already mentioned. Um, I have two related overarching points. The first is that the distinction between private religion and public politics so foundational to secularism is anchored in normative ideas about piety and sexuality. The second is that, like various forms of religiosity, secularity too includes a range of social, physical, and sexual dispositions, hence the need to apprehend the secular via its sensorial, aesthetic, and embodied dispositions, and not only its political and legal ones. And I'm picking up here on Ethan's point um, earlier in the morning about the secular state's investment in the female body in particular in its regulation of Jewish and Muslim subjects. So I want to begin with two court cases, but I turn to the law again to unpack the protocols of secular sexuality that are, I want to argue, entangled in and reproduced by the law. In the first case, as the result of a massive outcry, a French tribunal in 2008 overturned an earlier court's decision to grant a marriage annulment to a couple, Madame H, Madame H and Monsieur C. The initial annulment had been granted on the basis that the wife had lied about being a virgin before marriage. The French, civil co the French Civil Code allows for annulments based on errors about the essential quality of the marriage partner, and Madame H. did not contest the, de the decision, so the case, one of several hundred marriages annulled yearly in France, should have remained inconspicuous. But Madame H. and Monsieur C. are Muslim. Upon hearing about the annulment, politicians and pundits demanded its reversal, contending that French secularism, or laïcité, should be protected from the sexism of Islamic norms. Much to her display then, Madame H's sex life became a very public affair. <laughs> 
In a different case, in 2007, a young woman named Horia Demieti sued a vacation cottage owner for religious discrimination after the latter refused to rent to Demieti unless she removed her headscarf in public areas. In the ensuing trial, the cottage owner's lawyer contended that Demieti was not refused lodging because she was Muslim, but because she wore a headscarf, which the lawyer uh, claimed, quote, is not simply a religious sign, but is worn to hide the fact that one is a woman, unquote. At one point, he turned directly to Demieti and demanded, and you, madame, why do you wear this headscarf? Though she didn't feel like she owed him an explanation about her religious practice, Demieti felt compelled to explain the details of, her, of the spiritual path that had led her to put on the headscarf. As she later told me, I couldn't not respond. I wanted to show him that I was a modern French woman, not a doormat in the kitchen. Pas une soumise toujours dans la cuisine. Though seemingly quite different, together these two cases reveal an important aspect of secular power. In secular liberal societies like France, religion and sex are in principle private affairs beyond the purview of state intrusion. In fact, secularity has come to be seen as the necessary guarantor of women's sexual freedom from the clutches of fundamentalist religion, Islam in particular. Yet these two cases demonstrate how the key to upholding secularity depends on violating the public-private distinction that underpins secularism's organization of political and social life, both in the way in which Muslim sexual and religious practices have become objects of intense public debate and state regulation, witness um, debates in France about polygamy, about veiling, about virginity certificates, and in the way in which the political, legal, and institutional practices aimed at securing secularity compel Muslim French women to reveal the innermost details of their sexual and spiritual lives in the public sphere. Horia Demieti is certainly not the only woman, the only veiled woman being asked, and you, madame, why do you wear this headscarf? Muslim French women thereby have to make public two domains usually considered private, even intimate, namely sexuality and religiosity. These incitements to discourse, as Foucault might say, about both sex and religion underscore the competing and often contradictory imperatives of the secular state. The secularization of Islam, understood as necessary to Muslim integration in France, requires the constant regulation and surveillance of religious life in order to verify that Muslims are being properly religious. That's what Naomi describes. Moreover, within the dominant narrative of immigrant integration, the future of secular France depends on the sexual regulation and normalization of immigrant origin populations. Secular government therefore entails two competing imperatives of privatization and surveillance. The political, legal, and institutional discourses and practices that attempt to separate private from public must open up and render public the normatively private spiritual and sexual lives of Muslim women in order to regulate them. And these competing imperatives of privatization and surveillance produce a second set of contradictory demands on Muslim women, namely to hide and to exhibit, to make private and to render public. In the secular imagination, proper religiosity is private religiosity. Yet in order to show that they are properly religious, that is secular, Muslim women are compelled to speak about their religious beliefs and practices and to justify various forms of aberrant religiosity, wearing a headscarf, praying regularly, um, fasting at Ramadan. A similar compulsion, uh, uh, um, sorry, a similar compulsion applies to their abnormal sex lives as well, covering and dressing modestly, practicing chastity before marriage, sanctioning polygamy, for example. Muslim women must often disclose in public, on television shows, before government commissions, and in sociologies and anthropologies of Islam in France, these Muslim women must disclose the beliefs and practices that constitute their otherwise private sexual lives in order to demonstrate that they are, as Demieti put it, modern French women. Interestingly, it's not only fundamentalist Muslim women who are caught in this incitement to discourse, but also self-declared secular Muslim women, musulman laïc as well. Consider the plethora of autobiographies uh, by women like Fadila Amara, Lubna Melian, and Siam Abchi, all musulman laïc. Given that it is the most intimate of nonfiction genres, it is perhaps unsurprising that the autobiography has emerged as such a popular source of information about Muslim French women's lives. 
The most powerful remains Samira Belil's Don l'enfer des tournantes, in the hell of gang rapes, in which Belil narrates her journey from abuse at the hands of her father, to her trauma as the victim of multiple gang rapes in the housing projects, to her descent into alcohol and drug addiction, to her ultimate recovery, which includes learning how to have normal sexual and romantic relationships. Though Belil clearly considered this a profoundly personal story and wrote it as part of her therapy, her therapist encouraged her to publish it, and the book was marketed by her publishers as a window into the general sexual savagery of the banlieue. According to the publisher, the text, quote, unveils the sexual violence that has been institutionalized and made ordinary in the banlieue, unquote. The metaphor of unveiling used by Belil's publisher is significant. For as much as Belil pulls back the veil on life in the banlieue, she does so by offering up her troubled, familial, sexual, and romantic life for public perusal. The structure of that double unveiling underscores the way in which the narratives of secular Republican integration, in which normalized sexuality signals successful integration, requires women like Belil, Amara, and Méliane to reveal publicly the most intimate details of their private lives in order to be recognized as integrated subjects. If normal sex is private sex, these secular women, these secular Muslim women must nonetheless prove their normality precisely by bringing their sex lives into the public sphere for monetized consumption by a literary public. If Belil and others, by unveiling their private sexual lives, have at least been partially accepted as integrated subjects, other Muslim French women, and especially veiled women, have not, though they are no less incited to speak about their sexual beliefs and practices. Consider a January 2004 episode of 100 Minutes to Understand, a 100 Minutes pour Comprendre, entitled God and the Republic. Though most of the show concerned the then proposed law banning religious signs, it suddenly veered midpoint into a pre-recorded segment on virginity certificates. The segment began by observing that many immigrant Muslim families demand certificates of virginity for, uh, from their potential daughters-in-law. It then featured a local association that organizes against virginity certificates and includes a number of veiled women. The reporter interviews one of these veiled women, one who states that though it rem remains important not to have sex before marriage, quote, no woman should have to show herself like that, unquote. While such an attitude seems perfectly logical within an ethic of bodily sovereignty, the reporter frames these veiled women's position against virginity certificates as a paradox, noting bemusedly that, quote, even though they are against the certificate, they are for chastity in marriage. Unquote. The short segment ends tangentially with the reporter's statement that, the, that women of immigrant descent are twice as likely to suffer sexual aggression than are French women. When the show came back to its debate format, the moderator immediately turned to Saida Kada, a veiled Muslim French activist, and one of a dozen or so guests, and asked, is what we heard true? Of course it is, Kada replied, but we're speaking about something, i.e. sexual aggression and virginity certificates. We're speaking about something for which Islam and the veil are not responsible. Kada then quickly asserted her own disapproval of virginity certificates. This moment is remarkable in exemplifying a common double move. Not only do secular Republicans explicitly associate the headscarf with abnormal sexual practices and sexual violence, but then they also demand that veiled women account for that association. Kada is immediately put on the spot, called upon to prove her normality as well as her legitimacy as an interlocutor by condemning abnormal sexual practices. Because she wears a headscarf and is immediately sexually suspect, Kada is com compelled to reveal herself as sexually normal by stating her sexual beliefs in public. But precisely because she already wears a headscarf, because she is religiously suspect, she can never, in fact, be sexually normal within the terms of French secularity. Her viewpoint remains a paradox at best, fundamentalist double talk at worst. These overlapping acts of incitement, surveillance, and castigation occur in less mediatized settings as well. Garima, a longtime interlocutor, described to me the kind of compulsion she experiences in, day, in her day-to-day -day life as a result of putting on the headscarf almost a decade ago. When you're a veiled woman, Karima began, people want to know you intimately. Because the veil remains so maligned in France, quote, you do everything you can to feel accepted. Though she now feels less dependent on the acceptance of others for her own self-worth, she related how, in the first years of wearing the headscarf, she was constantly smiling and engaging others in order to prove she was sans complexe, without hang-ups. Quote, they take away your speech in the media, you speak with abandon in private space to say, look, I'm normal. When I, forced, when I first wore the headscarf, I needed to speak to prove that I was normal, unquote. 
Karima's urge to speak echoes, the experience, uh, echoes that experience by Horia Demiati when the lawyer Varro demanded why she wears the headscarf. On the one hand, Demiati realized that her inner spirituality was her own private affair. On the other, she felt compelled to answer the question to show that underneath the headscarf, she was normal. If Demietti was compelled to speak publicly about religion and to reveal the inner workings of her spiritual and ethical life, Garima has also had to talk about sex and religion. She described working with another veiled friend at a small law office in Paris, and I quote, our boss, Anne, our boss Anne, saw right away that we were veiled, and you know, you know what, right away the questions came. How do you live? What do you think of polygamy? Tell me about your sexuality, etc." Karima answered honestly that she was not against polygamy, explaining that she found the framework of polygamy less troubling than adultery. But she is aware that saying so has consequences. I mean, I risk looking like a fundamentalist, she told me. She also recognized the dynamic at work in these incitements to speak about sex. You're being tested, she said. You're often spoken to about homosexuality. You're spoken to with crude words about sex. You're being tested. You have to prove that you're normal. She described another moment with Anne, who once said nonchalantly to Karima, her employee, recall, not her friend, said nonchalantly to Karima that she'd like to take a lover. Anne then asked Karima what she thought. Laughing incredulously at the memory, Karima continued, what does she want me to say? It's haram, it's forbidden. What does she want me to say? Having already revealed herself as a fundamentalist in their previous conversation about polygamy, Karima kept her mouth shut this time. These incitements to discourse about sex and religion are not simply parallel modalities of secular power, however. The regulation of sex and the regulation of religion and concomitant notions of proper secular sex and proper secular religion are far more deeply imbricated, or so I want to argue. To do that, I turn to the organization Ni Put Ni Soumis, Neither Whores Nor Doormats, founded by Lubna Melian and Fadela Amara to protest the denigration of immigrant origin women in the banlieue. Much of the success of Ni Put Ni Soumis can be attributed to the way in which its leaders offered themselves up and were eagerly read as liberated, integrated counterparts to the paradigmatic menace of the veiled women, of the veiled woman. These are slides of a 2003 photographic exhibit of 14 women from Ni Put Ni Soumise dressed as the revolutionary icon Marianne. The exhibit was mounted on the facade of the National Assembly. In this narrative, liberation and integration hinge on these secular Muslim women's active embrace of secular Republican heterosexual norms. In her autobiography, for example, Niput Nisumi's founder, Fadila Amara, identifies wearing makeup and certain forms of dress, quote, short skirts, tight-fitting jeans, low-cut blouses, and short t-shirts, unquote, as necessary to, quote, showing off our femininity against the backdrop of Muslim patriarchy. In testimony before the Guerin Commission, which proposed the 2010 ban on full-face veils, Siam Abchi, another former leader of Niput Nisumis, declared that she, unlike her veiled counterparts, was not ashamed of her body, removing her jacket with a flourish to reveal her bare shoulders. And at this point, a number of the commission members applauded. Amara and Abchi underscore the nexus of sex and secularism, which Joan Scott has called secularism. What is particularly striking is how certain aesthetic practices, like wearing makeup and short skirts, and certain forms of bodily display, bare legs, bare shoulders, uncovered hair, and bare face, have become essential to the sexual protocols of secularity in France. Also striking is how the heterofemininity of French secularity relies on a series of juxtapositions. As the organization's name suggests, the model of heterofemininity represented by ni put ni soumise depends on a sexualized contrast between the sexually abnormal musulman laïc and her two sexually, between the sexually normal musulman laïc and her two sexually abnormal counterparts, the veiled doormat, la soumise, and the whore, la pute. If la soumise represents repressed sexuality and a lack of femininity, la pute represents an excessive sexuality that breaches the bounds of proper femininity. Moreover, if the sexual abnormality of the unfashionable soumise emerges from her refusal to participate in consumerist femininity, the pute takes consumerism too far, commodifying her own body. The semantic juxtaposition enacted by Ni Put Ni Soumis replays a wider logic of secular sexuality, evidenced by various laws that seek to regulate and reform Muslim women. 
Most well known are the, are the 2004 law banning headscarves in public schools and the 2010 law banning face veils in all public spaces. Politicians have also suggested the need for a law prohibiting paid childcare providers from wearing headscarves so that French children are not exposed to abnormal ideas about sex and gender. These laws on veiling parallel other measures deployed against non-white immigrant origin women to guarantee the republic's sex norms. In March 2003, for example, a new law on internal security criminalized passive soliciting for sex, and the law mandates that in addition to the usual fine and prison time, a non-national arrested for passive soliciting can have her residence permit revoked. What I want to emphasize with this very brief foray into the seemingly unrelated criminalization of prostitution and veiling is that they are, in fact, related, and that Niput Nisumis makes explicit a wider secular Republican logic. To be sexually normal and therefore fully secular is to be Niput Nisumis, neither veiled nor um, whore. That nini, neither nor structure of secular Republican sexuality, repeats itself within the figure of la soumise, or la musulmane voilée. Consider the Demiati court case I referred to earlier, when the defense lawyer, Maître Alexandre Varro, declared that, quote, the headscarf is not simply a religious sign, it is worn to hide the fact that one is a woman, unquote. Varro's is a fairly common understanding of the headscarf as hiding or dissimulating the fact of womanhood. In this view, women lose their feminine identity if their bodies cannot be seen. Joan Scott persuasively argues that within, sec within Republican ideology, feminine identity depends on male desire, and male desire depends on visual stimulation. The quality of being a woman depends on one's femininity, which in turn depends on one's normative heterosexuality. And that normative sexuality requires that a woman be uncovered, that she show off her femininity, that she reveal her sex. Yet the demand to exhibit is coupled with a simultaneous demand to hide. On the one hand, mainstream Republican feminists now equate gender equality with sexual emancipation and the visibility of the female body. On the other, many of these feminists have long criticized sexual exhib exhibitionism for reducing women to their sexed bodies. Gender equality seemingly depends on some kind of visibility, thus the consistent demand by public school teachers pre-2004 that veiled students apparently showing too little of themselves reveal their necks, earlobes, and hairlines as a compromise. This was a constant refrain at the high school at which I worked, with teachers asking veiled students to pull their headscarves down to show a little hair or show their ears. But girls should not show too much of themselves either, as demonstrated by the 2003 Affaire du String, when some schools began sending home girls whose thong underwear was visible between their low-cut pants and cropped t-shirts. Pundits bemoaned the over-sexualization of young women and the way in which, as Socialist Party, or lead, Socialist Party leader Ségolène Royal, at the time she was the leader, put it, the String reduces young girls to a behind. This ambivalent relationship to the sexual visibility of the female body comes together in critiques of the veil. For as much as the veil is thought to hide the fact of one sexed body, it is equally criticized, often by the same detractors, for unnecessarily sexualizing the body and drawing attention to it. A number of critics contend, after all, that veiling contradictorily reveals what it is supposed to hide, namely the sexuality of a woman's body. According to one liberal political theorist, quote, it reveals by covering the sexuality that must be veiled is performatively construed through the very act of veiling it, unquote. Intended to dissimulate, the veil ends up exposing, and in so doing, it over-sexualizes women, confirming the presence of an inegalitarian gender system based on sexual difference and sexual inequality. This is, of course, a common secular critique of the veil that extends well beyond France. Australian feminist Bron uh, Bronwyn Winter repeats this contention in her analysis of the French hijab controversy. Examining the close relationship between hair and sexuality across various patriarchal cultural formations, she compares veiled women to, and I quote, models, dancers, singers, strippers, escorts, hostesses, and street sex workers alike who display and toss with practice nonchalance often elaborately coiffed locks in a carefully coded performance of titillation. The hijab is a hypersexualizing marker par excellence." Unquote. Turning to what she calls the paradoxical nature of the French hijab, Winter approvingly cites Moroccan feminist Maria Barnini interviewed for Libération. Quote, and this is Barnini, if one refers to the spirit of the Quran, the veil's objective is that women do not attract attention, are not stared at. Young French women who wear the veil are not, however, doing so to become invisible, but on the contrary, to become visible. 
The veil does not protect them, it exposes them. There's an odd mix of rebellion, religion, and star academy, unquote. You all know what star academy is, kind of American Idol uh, reality show. Drawing on Bernini's assertion, a widely shared opinion amongst French Republicans and Anglo-American liberals alike, Winter seeks to underscore the ostensibly contradictory nature of the headscarf. Though it attempts to hide the fact that one is a woman, it ends up revealing it in excess of the normal protocols of female sexuality. Interestingly, the veiled woman and the whore are once again juxtaposed here, though this time as analogous figures of hypersexualization. The musulmane voilée becomes épute et soumise both whore and doormat. Whether the veil reveals too much or too little, or both too much and too little, Winter's reference to strippers, sex workers, and veiled women invokes the ni ni neither nor logic of secular sexuality in which women must reveal something of their sex body, but not too much. Getting that alignment right, revealing neither too much nor too little, being ni pute ni soumise, constitutes the basis, I would argue, of normative secular sexuality. Bahnini's earlier juxtaposition of the headscarf as an odd mix of religion and star academy is also telling. The mix is odd because religion is supposed to be private, not performed in public. Within the conventional Protestant quasi-secular definition of religion, religion con concerns the transcendental or otherworldly and manifests in ascetic practices if it manifests at all. Within the secular definition of religion, a concern with adornment, and especially with adornment that signals feminine sexuality, is seen as incompatible with religiosity. The notion that religion does not mix with sexuality or femininity underpins the widespread sense among many Republicans and liberals alike that wearing a headscarf with makeup and fashionable clothes is somehow contradictory. The internationally renowned Egyptian feminist Nawala Sadawi exemplifies this reaction, which is common across France and I think across Europe more generally. Writing about young French women protesting the 2004 law banning religious signs, Sadawi dismissively notes that, quote, the young women wearing the veil are often clothed in tight-fitting jeans, their faces covered with layers of makeup, their lips painted bright red, the lashes around their eyes thick and black or blue with heavy mascara, unquote. We, the readers, are left to infer the supposed contradiction between true piety and this kind of feminine sexual adornment, one that signals the apparent inauthenticity of these women's religiosity. Similarly, Winter refers to what she calls the Star Academy syndrome to question the actual religiosity of veiled girls, writing, quote, there is definite, there's a definite market, uh, media marketable coolness about being a modern Muslim girl in trendy jeans and a hijab, unquote. Winter implies that Muslim girls take up the hijab not because they have any interest in becoming more pious, but because they want to be fashionable. Winter's reading of these girls' intentions relies on the juxtaposition of trendy jeans and the hijab, which in turn relies on the common assumption that religion, real religion, does not have any truck with any such markers of feminine adornment and feminine sexuality. Winter's critique reveals how much the secular imperative to define proper religion and proper sexuality relies on and reproduces an oppositional relationship between sexuality and religion. Religion and sexuality are brought together in this logic to demarcate what is properly religious, that which is not sexual, and what is properly sexual, that which is not religious. To return to my overarching point then, secularism does not simply entail the parallel regulation of sex and religion, rather secular religiosity and secular sexuality are constituted and normalized together. Concomitantly, perverse sexuality and perverse religion are also constructed together, hence the common trope of the veiled soumise as sexually repressed and the image of the male Muslim as equally sexually abnormal and as simultaneously oversexed and repressed. So let me finish with two concluding remarks that may help to open up just, not just my talk but also maybe frame my paper in Naomi's. Scholars often refer to secularity's construction of religion. We often talk about the construction of religion, but we usually mean construction metaphorically. We may want to think in more concrete terms, quite literally in Naomi's case, about the materiality of the boundary drawing, of, of the boundary drawing so central to laicite and about how the boundary between public and private and concomitant boundaries between religion and politics, religion and economy, religion and culture, religion and sexuality, religion and art, how these boundaries are enacted, materialized even, across and through physical spaces and physical bodies. <laughs> 
Second, we may also want to think of laicite and secularism more generally as more than just a political and legal configuration, and to think about the problem Islam and specific forms of Islamic piety post to laicite on sensorial, affective, and bodily registers. In a 2010 essay, the anthropologist Charles Hirschkind asked, quote, is there a secular body? Or in somewhat different terms, is there a particular configuration of the human sensorium of sensibilities, affects, embodied dispositions specific to secular subjects and thus constitutive of what we mean by secular society, unquote. Hirschkin and others argue that the secular is not a space-clearing arrangement of political and affective neutrality, but rather a site of robust norms, affects, emotions, embodied dispositions, and ethical, disposi uh, ethical sensibilities. Like religious bodies, then, the secular body or secular bodies need to be examined as sites of marked fullness rather than of unmarked absence. As I've tried to show today, and I'll end here, this kind of analysis has to attend to sex gender, to the secular investment in female bodies, and to the sex gendered configuration of the sensibilities, bodily dispositions, affects, and norms that underpin laicite. Thank you. Thank you, my auntie, and thank you, Naomi, uh, both of you for these intriguing and beautifully complimentary talks, um, which point to the historically specific and evolving nature of Republican um, secularism and demonstrate the fraught distinction between public and private from the interwar years to today. Um, so there's a lot to, to talk about here. I, and. We're running a bit late, but I think we can take um, a half an hour for discussion. Um, so I'd like to open the floor. Yes. Thank you both so much for your talk. Um, my question is kind of twofold um, and is primarily sparked by the, the second paper, but I, I want to incorporate the first paper as well. Um, you talked a lot about the ways in which, uh, you know, French Muslim women present themselves to a majority white secular French public, and I'm kind of curious about what the conversations around the veil, around um, feminism and Islam, are within, behind closed doors, um, and I guess the second part of that question is that if those conversations are happening, where are they happening? Because it does seem that there is. Um, there's quite a bit of policing and surveillance of the Muslim community, particularly in this political moment. Conversations about? About Islam, femininity, and the veil. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, there are questions amongst different kinds of, I mean, Okay, let me, let me preface this by saying I don't like the term Muslim community. I, I know you didn't use it, but there isn't one Muslim community, and so there are like multiple conversations that are happening. Um, and I think the, the vast, I mean, so the, my research was mostly with um, sort of practicing or pious Muslim women who I know are, uh, let, me, let, me, let me preface this by saying, so the reason I'm hesitating is because I have been thinking a lot about the, the, um, the mode of disclosing itself. And um, I think I want to get out of a model in which I talk about the Republic and its sex norms, and, and then I'm asked to talk about Muslim French women themselves and what happens behind closed doors. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think that's a kind of mode of interrogation and a kind of frame research paradigm that we're really used to. And I, I kind of want to resist it. And, um, and I'm not sure, I mean, I thought your paper was really interesting because you both uh, lay out the framework of the demand for visibility and then sort of talk about, um, you know, Muslims who are kind of just doing their own thing in other spaces. And I think it's worth having a discussion about what we want to put on the table and what we don't. Um, and to think about our own, the compulsions of, of research and the kinds of demands that are, 
that are laid before us as um, anthropologists and historians who work on Islam. I think both Naomi and I think of ourselves as, of, as, as scholars who work on France. Mm -hmm. um, but do you see what I'm saying? So I, I don't know if this is a conversation that the rest of you want to have. It's certainly something that I think about a lot. Um, and so I will answer the question by saying that there are lots of conversations that are happening with regard to um, the way that one is perceived in the public sphere, given that um, one is immediately read as performing for, or one is immediately read as, as making certain kinds of semiotic gestures, as opposed to practicing, right? Um, so there is a lot of conversation about that. But I think I want to step up a meta level and actually try to think about what we're doing when we're asking and answering those kinds of questions in the first place. Yes, Orida. Yes, I'd like to follow up on, the, on this question and, and on your answer because it, it seems to me that it's true you're pointing to an interesting issue which is that when you talk about Islam and the Republic, so being Muslim in a country like France is also um, experienced through the, the dual experience of being Muslim in relation to the French or to the way that the French see you, so that's the visibility that is accompanied by a request for you know, um, interpretation, what does it mean to be Muslim? So, on, but on the other hand, there's also the idea that the experience of simply living as a Muslim. And that kind of reality is that within a single context, you know, Muslim context, people do different things within the same family. There isn't the same religious observance. Some people will fast during Ramadan, others won't. Some people within the same family space. So it's interesting that this is perhaps what is invisible in this discourse, which has placed the light on the kind of public visibility. What's invisible is that the private sphere is actually the locus, not so much of you know, discussions that take place behind closed doors, but rather the kind of practice of plurality and pluralism and you know, diversity in religious expression that I think is hidden from view. And I think that's, you know, it, it's difficult to introduce that into the public discourse. But you said it yourself when you said there isn't a single community, right? But that, this is what that means, right? May I just add quickly, I mean, we've talked about this in the morning session about the structural, you, you raised a question about the structural uh, asymmetry between you know, Jewish communities and Muslim communities, but this is also one of them, I think, that there's a demand for information about Muslim communities that there is, I mean, there isn't the same kind of demand for information. And, and if there is, it's, you know, it's, it's structured differently, right? So I think this is just something that I've been struggling with for a long time about the, the compulsion on me to disclose certain kinds of, precisely the kinds of things that are happening, you know, in private. Yes, Ian. Thanks for this fascinating case. It's really just uh, brilliant ideas that I kind of, opening up lots of, lots of questions for me in terms of applying them back into the 18th century. Um, but I just, I guess I had a question. I mean, I remember having <laughs> a heated conversation with Bronwyn Winter about some of these questions. <laughs> She's a fellow Australian, so, um, and she was telling me that, you know, practices of veiling are not justified by Islam, right? So she's telling me what Islam says, she's not a Muslim, but she nonetheless, and this is a very, very common in France in general of non-Muslims telling Muslims what Islam says and what they should do as if, and not understanding what the actual <laughs> nature of this kind of, of the actual practice, and I mean, this is Urida's point as well, that, you know, it varies in the same family, it varies in, in cultural ways, and that, you know, I mean, I, I also think of, um, I think of, of uh, you know, my friends who, who, who live in West Africa and where veiling is extremely uncommon, mm -hmm. but who will, will, will defend all other forms of veiling because that is also defending their decision not to veil, right, in the sense that they have the freedom within Islam to apply and decide just as other people have a decide, you know, can, can apply it in other ways that might not be conventional. But, in thinking about the multiplicity of Islam, I also just wanted to kind of think of it the other way about the multiplicity of the Republic, that are we, do we risk something in constituting this monolithic conception of the Republic as opposed to Republics? And so in a specific sense, I just wanted to ask Naomi about the Rue des Comptes 
and the ways in which that was staffed by Colon from, from, from Algeria, right? And so, I mean, these are two completely, completely conflicting conceptions of what the Republic was being, you know, used, those institutions being used as places in which, you know, they are, they are in, 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 in conflict with one another. And I guess the same with Mayanti's questions about the, about the, 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 the ways in which the Republic responds to, to, to women and the ways in which, you know, different Republics are being called upon and mobilized in different ways. And it's not just a question of saying, you know, we are kind of Republican and, and uh, Muslim, but which Republic, <laughs> you know, we had the, the Indigen de la République, which was one attempt to draw upon that, however successful that was, but, you know, maybe la République was one of the things that was causing <laughs> them difficulties. Yeah, thank you, um, Ian, for that, for that question. I think I, I do take your point. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I, that I would agree that what's happening in Le Bon de Comte and the Algerian colonial administration are not actually part of the same republic. I think they, they inform each other and constitute each other. So I, I certainly do take your point that the republic is not in any way more unitary than the Muslim community or Islam. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, if we think along the lines of Gary Wilder about an imperial nation state or the way that the, the Republic is fundamentally something that we have to understand in a larger imperial context, that there isn't necessarily a, dis a useful distinction to be made with that particular example of what's happening with policing colonial subjects in the metropole in the 1920s and 30s with what is happening in Algeria or elsewhere. Um, but I, I do take your point that neither the Republic nor the state are necessarily unitary objects that we can manipulate and move around and say what they are saying about, about Islam. I, I, I'm certainly guilty of having done that at, at some point, but I do think that, that I, I would want to take seriously the, the idea that the Republic, in terms of its, um, all of its contradictions in both the metric and the county, need to be thought together. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, it's a, sorry, may I answer that question too? Um, that's a great point and a great question. I'll just be really short. Um, I, I think there's a way in which one could argue that the, the contradictions of the republic in some sense, of the state, and its attempt to manage those various contradictions is precisely what maintains the power of the republic. Um, that's something that I have sort of tried to think through. But I do really um, think it's important to, as your work did this morning to think about the various kinds of political possibilities that are al always already built into what we're calling the republic. And I think Gary's work does that, his recent Freedom Time book, you know, Todd Shepard's work on that sort of moment, right, um, after the war, um, after, after sort of just before decolonization. So, and I think that there's a way in which a lot of um, activists in France are trying to mobilize precisely the the subjugated histories and the, subject, the sort of subjugated histories of the republic to remake the republic from within. And I think politically, not just analytically, but politically, I think that's a really useful project. Yes, Ethan. Thanks for two great, fascinating papers. Um, I have a question uh, for, for each of you. Um, Naomi, I, I noticed, I, I, mean, I liked the way that you gave a kind of genealogy and you started with Manuel Valls talking about putting Islam at the heart of the Republic. And I guess my question is just, there's a lot that we can say about continuities um, and, and I know you emphasize those continuities uh, in your book to a significant degree about discourses about Islam and about Muslims over time. Um, and and I, I don't want to discount those, but I guess my question is, what does it mean for Manuel Valls or someone else to talk about putting Islam at the heart of the Republic when the Republic is no longer an empire, uh, when the sort of imperial symbolism of the mosque, I'm not saying it disappears altogether, but it, it's inevitably different. Um, and, and I guess I, I just, it, part of what I want to ask is whether there's more, um, not sure what the right, whether it's emancipatory or liberalizing or what the right word is, potential within such a call in the contemporary context uh, than in some of the earlier contexts. Um, Mayanti, I, uh, with, with, with a lot of um, respect for 
the kind of discursive traps that a lot of your uh, paper, I think, point us toward really insightfully. I, I want to ask you to, th to think or talk about what is still a reality which we haven't really uh, talked about here, uh, and that is of terror, right? I mean, we, we I think everyone who's spoken and, and perhaps everyone at the conference agrees uh, that uh, there's this, you know, vastly uh, problematic caricature of Muslims as terrorists, which is a huge part of what we're talking about. But we are also living in a moment where there have been terror attacks uh, in some ways uh, of an unprecedented um, uh, frequency and, and uh, lethality uh, in, in France by a very small number of Muslims. And I think that raises questions about, I mean, I, I uh, respect the point that you made in response to the issue of um, Muslim interiority and what's going on in Muslim spaces, right? So the question is, what's, how do we deal with a reality in which people are asking questions about what are going on in Muslim spaces, sometimes very liberal people who are advocating for Muslims because they want Muslims to show things are going on in those spaces uh, that are different than the caricature, right? Uh, and people are asking questions that in some cases have legitimate security bases, right? Um, and and I, uh, that sort of ties into this question also about, you know, the, the critique of things like me which is that in a certain way a lot of these people are trying to respond to these caricatures, right? They're trying to show uh, another face of Islam and even though I think your critique is really compelling, the question is how can people respond in a way that doesn't fall into those traps when we're dealing with such an overbearing discourse about Muslims as terrorists? Thanks, Ethan, um, for that question. And it's, um it's a question that I struggle with because I think that uh, there, you know, there are clear differences, structural and otherwise, in the 21st century and in the beginning of the 20th century. Not least that that many, not all, people who either self-identify or identified as Muslim are French citizens now, in a way that they weren't, um, and that they they can participate should they desire in these conversations in ways that in ways that were not available to them at the beginning of the 20th century. So in that sense, certainly the conversations are different. And um, and I mean, this echoes back to something I was thinking about with the question that you asked earlier, which is, you know, I don't talk about or I didn't talk about in this book what um, a lot of what Muslims themselves were saying. I was really looking at what the state is um, what the state is trying to say about Islam, rather than looking at the ways in which um, trying to speak for Muslims about what they, how they were thinking about um, the kind of Islam they wanted to, to live or to see respected or, or anything of the, that nature. And so the question of what, what, whether there's something emancipatory or liberatory in Manuel Vaz calling for Islam to be heard at the heart of the Republic with the same language that's used um, at an earlier moment, um, a lot of his other statements are, are imply a kind of definition of what acceptable Islam is that kind of undercuts the emancipatory or participatory nature of that discussion. And I think the way that the state's relationship with Islam is still structured um, in terms of organizations and um, and and all this kind of thing creates a situation in which there is not a whole lot of part room for an emancipatory, um, inclusive, I, that's not even the word I want to use, um, participation in defining a project of what Islam de France, Islam en France, whatever one word one wants to use, would look like. I'm not sure what it would look like. Um, and it's when the state is, is uh, inviting members of a religious community who, as we've been saying so far, are very diverse and not in any way um, uniform in their desires or, or beliefs, to to put themselves at the heart of the republic, it's an injunction rather than. So I'm not sure that I would see it as emancipatory, though I take your point about um, noting changes and evolution rather than, than continuity. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. I mean, it's really a sort of question about also just pragmatic, what, what, we, what we do, right, as researchers. Um, and I think just, uh, again, on a kind of purely pragmatic level, how do you, you know, respond to the way in which Muslims are positioned as somehow abnormal in a context of terror, what are they doing, um, is audience, right? So my guess is that, you know, I mean, I guess that this room is reasonably friendly. <laughs> um, so then I want to keep the focus on the republic, 
uh, in a different context with a different audience, I think, you know, this is something that I, I really struggle with. I struggle with in the introduction of my book. I kind of, you know, because if we're not saying anything, we leave the field open to a lot of people who are saying a lot of things that with which we disagree, that precisely, you know, serves the kind of war on terror and the, and the surveillance of Muslims. So um, I do think that, I mean, you're right, there has to be a kind of normalization via ethnography via sociology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think that we, those of us who do that need to consistently turn the lens back and ask why this is happening in the first place, right? So I think there's a way in which that can be done in our work. It's something that I struggle with. Um, but you're, you're right to bring up the fact that this is a context in which, um, it's a particular context in which there have been unprecedented ter terrorist attacks and Therefore, there's a lot of suspicion about even just ordinary Muslims, and there's something definitely of worth talking about the way that ordinary Muslims are just ordinary Muslims. Let's take, um, I think, Hillary, you had a question, one more question, and then we'll break. <clears throat> In the first case you mentioned, the, the woman in court um, oh, sorry. Um, who had to disclose her sexuality. So when, peop when there's a visible symbol of clothing or the a kippah, I would assume he's Jewish, the, the headscarf, uh, the burqa, you're Muslim. So you, you, vis you have a visible um, display, you know that person is, is religious. So, but they're looking at a religious question, I think. I mean, it, I don't know whether that case was in a divorce court or in a... No, it was like a, um, she, it was a religious discrimination court case. So, in a, our courts are secular. And the courts, I assume, in France are secular. There are only two places that I know that have religious courts. One is in Israel, which governs all religion. And the others are, I assume, in most Muslim countries, in, in Islamic courts, where you would automatically, the, the, the religious people would be judging. Here you're asking for secular courts to judge whether a woman is a virgin. I don't even know if that's... Oh, <laughs> sorry, these are two different cases. Oh, so the okay. first case was actually a marriage annulment case where um, a French court, because within the French Civil Code, I can't remember, I think it's Article 170 of the French Civil Code, actually allows for annulments based on the errors um, in the essential qualities of a person. It was a nod to French Catholics and with the 1975 divorce reform. There are hundreds of annul annulments all the time, sometimes on questions of virginity. Um, but the, the issue for the court was not the question of virginity, it was about the lie. So if she hadn't lied and she, right? Okay, so, so, so the, that's what the court is judging. The court is not judging whether she's virgin But then the not. court had the right to ask her about her sexual life. To disclose it, I would assume, if that's the lie. I don't know, I mean, it just seems that they were you, looking at a case where there's a, a religious part to it and then in a secular court, if I were a lawyer, I would, that would, I'd go after that. <laughs> you know, whether she, she lied, so now let's see what she, what else right. is there? Well, again, to be clear, there's a, those are two different cases. Okay. So the one case is a marriage annulment case, and the other is, um, is, a, is a religious discrimination case. And I was reading the two together, in, in some ways partly because they do get confused okay. in the French imagination, right. Right, which is sort of interesting in and of itself, that, yeah. um, that the annulment case, which could have, the, the two, the two um, petitioners could have been Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or whatever, it didn't rest on any kind of religious, religiosity of the, of the issue, it really rested on um, a, a very specific um, question of the errors of the essential quality. And for, the, for Monsieur C, this was an important issue and, you know, and normally, and the court, I mean the court actually agreed with them the first time around. Mm. It's only in the, in the sort of, it's, it's only when the, the case is publicized that it becomes an issue about religion. Right, uh, and okay. then, right, so. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, the, we can continue this conversation over lunch, I hope. So we'll be breaking until 2 o'clock when our third panel will begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.